Morning, folks. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And just let me echo uh, the thanks to Carol Bingham. She's been absolutely wonderful uh, engaging with me almost for a full year now to prepare me for this meeting. And Bill, thank you for sponsoring my presence here. So my background is microbiology and genetics, um, but it's been a long time since I've worked at the bench. And it's because I get to do stuff like this these days. It's pretty easy to understand me. Um, I'm actually sitting in between this, in this Venn diagram of technology, business, and storytelling, basically visions. I, I basically live about five years in the future. If something is in the present today, there's better people than me for managing the processes or technology. Uh, there's definitely better people at business. But I'm one of the few people that moves around this world and sees where things are going and has a pretty rigorous set of filters to figure out where we should go. Somehow you guys, though, completely didn't make my radar for like 29 years. <laughs> so let me just say, in doing my background for this, um, for this presentation, one, I am in awe of what you do. I haven't done a significant result in research since I was a med lab tech and there were people at the other end of the blood results. You guys really do work that impacts lives. Sometimes you speak for the dead. I don't do any of that anymore. I just, I just tell crazy stories. I've also realized that my talk title the golden age of genomics is completely wrong because we're not in the golden age of genomics. <laughs> we are far from it. A period where the specified art skill or activity is at its peak? Uh-uh, uh-uh, no. We're just getting started today. And more than that, it's going to get a lot weirder than today. So my life has been spent at the intersection of two big technologies, one of them being computation, computers, electronics, and the other one being biology. And today we're all familiar with the cell phone. The cell phone concept, just the computer concept, hardware, software, data, printers, it's baked into our lives. It's been the biggest change in the world around us while I've been alive. As you saw in the video, almost no one knows anything about these cells. And of course, these cells are the foundation of every living thing on the planet. I love these cells, particularly the ones on the left, because I've worked with them the most. But like these cells are essentially printers. They're computers and printers that compute with molecules and print with molecules and they are literally are what the 3D printers we have in the world today aspire to be. They can take elemental materials and make incredibly complex mm, molecules. They run on sugar or sunlight. And basically, yeah, they, they can make more of themselves. A 3D printer that makes more 3D printers. And it all comes down to a genome. The genome is its program, it's its operating system. And in the case of E. coli, it's not even that big. But in the case of our genomes, six billion bases or so, well, that's medium. Plants have much larger genomes. But they all do essentially the same thing. And the low-lying cellular architecture, the underlying machinery of the cell, is pretty much conserved from bacteria all the way to us. That's remarkable. And it's remarkable that there's basically a single programming language. So when we started to digitize that code, starting in the late 1970s, early 1980s, it was a pretty big deal. Now granted, it got off to a slow start until the Human Genome Project was funded and launched. And even then, there were a lot of people that were skeptics that this would have any value for society spending $3 billion to go and read the code of a human being. But it was a pretty interesting project, and it changed my life. At the time, I was studying bacterial genomes. And five years into the Human Genome Project, these two guys, Craig Venter and Ham Smith, a Nobel Prize winner, published the first bacterial genome. 
That was 1995. And in fact, they didn't publish just one genome, they published two, mycoplasma and homophilus influenza. I was at that meeting at the American Society for Microbiology in Washington, D.C., and it was the closest thing I have ever seen in science to a rock concert. The, the air was electric. These were the first genomes ever sequenced of a living organism. Before that, they'd only done viruses. And I remember that night going out with a group of microbiologists and getting totally trashed because <laughs> there was something to celebrate there. And in fact, it changed my career because at the time I was doing, I was on a PhD track doing microbial genomics and I realized this technology is completely going to change that world. And a few months later, I found myself working at Amgen, one of the big biopharma companies, because they had a massive genome project underway, basically unlimited funding, and they wanted to build a bioinformatics team, and I joined them. A couple years after joining them, Craig Venter came along and said, hmm, there's these new sequencer devices, the ABI 3700. I'm going to fill a whole lab with these things, and we're going to sequence the human genome in a year and give the academic guys a real run for the money. I had actually seen this machine prototype two years earlier in 1995 at a lab bench in Edmonton, Canada, because the guts of that machine were developed in Canada. Little known fact. So I knew what this thing could do. My boss turned to me and said, what should I do with this Craig Venter guy? He wants some money. I said, write the damn check. <laughs> Best thing that ever happened. Of course, we know that the race turned pretty ugly towards the end of the 1990s. Ultimately, Craig and Francis Collins were, mm, let's just say, vocal in the press. And finally, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair pulled them together at the White House and said, ah, the genome race, let's call it a tie. All humanity wins. And that was a pretty cool thing. But the race, the, it was really a race to the starting line of genomics. It was the draft genome. It did, took a few more years to get polished up and finished. But you know, for a government project, it came in two years early and on budget. That, and that speaks to the power of the technology that powers genomics. And in fact, that technology just keeps on going today. As you know, this is the Sanger lab, but it looks like any other big genome lab in the world. You just have banks and banks and banks of automated sequencers turning 24-7. It's really the merging of computers and biology. In 2012, I had the privilege of introducing these two gentlemen. And, and this is, it, it closed a chapter in my life. Craig Venter, the, really the first person sequenced, and Vince Cerf, really the father of the internet. We both happened to be at the same meeting. They had never met. I brought them into a room together. I said, you two guys really shaped my life. Thank you. And then I went on and figured, well, well, what next? Well, I can, all I can say is, the influence that these people have had, and many other people that work with them, are continuing to drive the intersection of biology and electronics in some fascinating ways, right down to the molecular level. This is an Oxford nanopore smidge ion sequencer. This is still only available in, to a small number of people. The, their other units are now widely available. But this plugs into your phone. So essentially, soon you're going to be able to sequence DNA with just your phone. And this is actually an older technology. This is nanopore technology, which was conceived over 20 years ago and took about a billion dollars to develop and commercialize. This is another company that I've been tracking called Roswell Biotechnologies, literally out of this world, almost alien technologies. And it is actually the direct connection of polymerase molecules to CMOS chips. And you can read the addition of DNA as sequencing by synthesis happens in real time. And it's because we're getting really good at nanoelectronics today. And of course, we see this in this graph. The white line, Moore's Law, just essentially the rate of increase in the number of transistors per dollar on a chip. It's essentially flat line now. Moore's law is over in 2D. But DNA sequencing completely raced ahead of Moore's law after next generation sequencing technologies came to market around 2007. And to now it's, it's pretty much flatlined. It's still going to go down again with 
with groups like Roswell. We don't know what the bottom is yet, but we've had the $1,000 genome for over 18 months now. And that's not $1,000 reagent cost. That's $1,000 all in annotated medical grade genome delivered to a patient. That's remarkable. There's very few technologies that have advanced so quickly and come down in price so quickly, not even computers. You know, it's, it's, we, society hasn't caught up to this. Where most of society is today is with tests like 23andMe, which, which doesn't give you the full symphony of your genome, it just gives you name that tune. It only gives you a few markers. Or Ancestry.com, or Helix, there's a bunch of different companies. Veritas is the first company to break the $1,000 barrier, but even then, most people haven't heard of them. What's it really going to take to bring genomics to everyone? I started to obsess about that almost two years ago because this graph just, just took over my life for a while. The red line is just the cost of reading a human genome, and it's, it's fallen practically to zero. The green line is the amount of value we can get out of that information. And right now, it's pretty low. Right now, unless you've got a significant genetic disease, or again, maybe we need to identify someone, a paternity lawsuit, et cetera, we just don't get that much value. But we're starting to. We're learning how to interpret genomics and build an economy around it. And we're right at this inflection point now where we know that we can get more value out of a human genome than the cost of reading it. That makes DNA sequencing of humans economically exothermic. The more people you sequence, the more valuable your company gets. A few months ago, this company took its covers off. It's not the only one in its class. I call it second generation DNA testing. Nebula Genomics, it's founded by Dr. George Church at Harvard and a couple of graduate students in his lab. And it's a remarkable company because it's the first genomics company that I've seen that isn't really focused on the underlying technology of DNA sequencing. It's focused on building the marketplace essentially learning, putting people together to get that economic value out of a genome. And sometimes it's not economic value, sometimes it's informational value, because let's face it, in some situations our genome may be actually priceless. But this is what they're building. It's essentially a social network that includes people at the core, but as well payers, it's including health, which can be health insurance companies, it could be researchers, it could be pharma companies. It could be Procter & Gamble. It's bringing in researchers that can do this type of analysis and go deep. And it could be at all scales, small companies, large companies, labs, it doesn't matter. And ultimately service providers that can do DNA sequencing and other testing. It doesn't, it's not limited. So this is really the first company to build an economic foundation that makes it possible to sequence everyone on the planet. And I think it'll happen faster than most people appreciate. All these things start slow, but then they go off exponentially. If you kind of chart other technologies that have appeared over the last 75 years, the race to 50 million clients has, has gotten shorter and shorter. In some cases, you can go and get 50 million views of a video in 24 hours. You all remember Chewbacca Mom. But I expect that 2G DNA, because it kind of has a bit of an educational curve, will fall in somewhere here, somewhere between 4 and 13 years. I don't know exactly when, but I think it's going to take off pretty fast once we target the right communities, provide the right incentives, educate them in the right way. And in fact, one of the things I've actually said to Nebula is maybe you should have a do not sequence list where you have to send your DNA just to get lightly profiled so you get listed on a do not sequence list until you're ready to be sequenced. That'll get 50 million subscribers. I know this, genomes aren't enough. Genomes are just one aspect of our lives. It's what boots up our bodies 
when we're just a single cell. But it's really all the life experience, not just the life that we have, the life that we interpret, but all the life of our cells and the experience that they accumulate. That's ultimately what we're going to end up digitizing moving forward. You can imagine this almost as a digital avatar of you. I started experimenting with this a few years ago. Well, things like Fitbits and Apple Watches. The new Apple Watch is a really good sensor. <laughs> In fact, it's probably can, it's collecting more information than many people are comfortable with. Remember to take it off before sex. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> then I started doing stuff like this as part of an open project called the Parametric Human Project. I said, I want to be your first guinea pig. They took me to a studio where the very similar, well, actually it's the same studio that they use for digitizing actors in movies. And they, you can't see all the cameras here. There were, you know, it was almost 100 SLR cameras shooting raw. It generates this gigantic data file, but it turns me into an avatar. Now you've seen me in my underwear, so that's. <laughs> and of course they colorize it. That's not a photograph on the right there. That's just adding color from, from the camera. But it's from the camera feeds. But this is all digital. It all goes into a drafting program. And you can completely animate that body. It's all motion rigged. So I'm, I'm slowly going digital. And if you think that, oh, well, you need an expensive rig. It's too expensive to do this sort of thing. It's already coming to your home. This is a company called Naked Labs. Not a great name, but it's, but you can basically get a home scanner uh, f for about a thousand bucks. It's a little turntable you stand on, it scans you, and it, there's so many layers of analysis that they can start to put into that. And believe me, when you see yourself f completely in a digital model, you really start to set your goals about weight and <laughs> posture, <laughs> building some muscle. But I'm not satisfied with just looking at the outside. I had to go inside. So I had the Parametric Human Project scan me head to toe in an MRI, uh, including my brain. Thankfully, there is one in there. Um, and, and that's pretty remarkable. And I'm just open sourcing all of this data, which I know some of you might go, you are nuts. But it's kind of fun. Now MRIs, OK, we don't have home MRIs yet. But here's the cool thing. Um, they're coming. This is a woman by the name of Mary Lou Jepsen. She's brilliant. She's worked in a whole bunch of different technology companies that you know about, Google, Facebook, etc. But she develops imaging technology and display technology. This was her at TED earlier this year describing a technology that she's developed to de-scatter light. Turns out the human body will actually, you can pass light through most of our body, through our skulls, through our brains, through just about every part of our bodies, but it scatters light. It's translucent. It's not transparent. So you can run algorithms today to essentially de-scatter the light, and you can get micron scale resolution of brain tissue with just optics. So eventually, you could put on a hat in your home and get essentially MRI quality images. This is going to be really cool. It's also completely going to change baby monitoring. No more ultrasound, like literally photo photography. Combined. What this means is, moving forward, as genomics goes exothermic for humanity, is it's just going to pull in every other organism behind us. We're going to get so good at sequencing the world, every living organism, and building models of all these different organisms. It's, it's truly, we're at the start of a major shift. This is the biggest thing I've seen happen in genomics since the draft genome was published in 2000. So, Stay tuned. I know it's going to affect your work. Now, my work is completely on the other side of that coin most of the time. I've joined Nebula Genomics, by the way, as an advisor. Not so much about the core technology, they're brilliant, but just how to put people first. Because if I've learned anything in my life, it's just, it's all about people. It's not about the tech. It's not about the buildings that we're in. All that can go away. But people are priceless. I've also come to appreciate that we need to get better at writing DNA because we can't just keep putting up buildings and paving over rainforests. We have to start learning how to use biotechnology to meet the needs of humanity 
or our population is going to crash. Our ecosystems are going to crash. So that's why about 15 years ago, I made the switch from reading and analyzing DNA to how do we start writing it? I unab unabashedly became a genetic engineer. Now, it turns out the technology for writing DNA hasn't really changed that much in 40 years. It's phosphoramidite synthesis. You guys probably all use oligos in your work for PCR. PCR is routine. Amplify DNA. Use oligos for probably things like CRISPR if you do that work. But biology became modular when we could start assembling oligos into gene length fragments. So a group that I met out of MIT back in 2004, um, led by Tom Knight, a former electrical engineer who said, I've basically done everything I want to do in electrical engineering and switched over to biology, bringing his knowledge of engineering into biology, was inspired by the Lego brick and started making modular parts that could be assembled in a, in a kind of modular way just using a couple of restriction enzymes and a few antibiotic markers. It made the process of doing DNA assembly uh, something that could be automated or even done manually with a pipette and a few simple protocols. And they started to train up students to do this. Class at MIT, sorry about the low resolution photo, they didn't have high resolution cameras back then, 2004. But this group just kept growing and attracting more and more students that were interested in how to go and build genetic circuits. I'm skipping over every couple of years. By 2009, they outgrew MIT and they had to go to a conference center. And of course, all the grad students that were helping Tom do this work, grow this community of researchers, they graduated and Tom and his core group of graduate students founded a company called Ginkgo Bioworks in 2008. And it was a great time to found a biotech company because if you remember there was a whole financial crisis and a whole bunch of companies went bankrupt. So they got basically their lab built at pennies on the dollar by buying equipment from defunct biotechs. That's their uh, lab of, or their wall of, of barcodes from various companies. Today, they're the first synthetic biology company that's valued at over a billion dollars. It took less than a decade to achieve that valuation. This field is moving fast. And they're not the only ones. It, there's a group called Zymergen that I work closely with and have tracked carefully. It it's, looks like this. It's basically a robotic lab to do materials science by reprogramming cells to make novel materials. And, uh, if, I, if I'm going to drive a point home to anyone today thinking about life science, is you're not going to wear a lab coat and stand there with a pipette most of the days. You're going to be programming robots to do thousands of experiments per day continuously, if not millions of experiments. And you'll have to be a data scientist because it's, it, these machines generate incredible amounts of high value data. They never take a break. They're, and sometimes they're easier to program than a grad student. But that's metabolic engineering. That's reprogramming a cell to make high value compounds. Typically, it's about 50,000 base pairs of code that you're working with. Well, I'm interested in writing whole genomes. Always have been. I want to build genomes from scratch. The first guy to do that was this guy. His name is Eckert Wimmer. I never trust anyone with a bow tie, by the way. But Eckerd Wimmer is at, was at Stony Brook University, still is, and he was the first guy to make a synthetic virus back in 2002. Now, it wasn't very popular. He was funded by the Defense Department. It took him a year and a half ordering oligos from various mail order houses. It cost about a half million dollars to do, and he was working with polio virus, which wasn't a great ambassador for the field of virology. But he was successful. He was able to synthesize and assemble the genome, boot up the virus, and show that it was equivalent to the virus stocks that he had in his freezer. Synthetic Genomics was founded by Craig Venter in 2005, and he has, and his team, he's built an incredible team of scientists, were the first to 
publish the genome, a fully synthetic genome of a bacterial cell. That was 2010. And then in 2016, he made an updated version of that bacterial genome, kind of stripped down racing car version. And what's surprising to me is in, it's been eight years now since the first synthetic bacterial genome, is you can look in the literature, no other scientific group anywhere in the world has made synthetic bacterial genome number two. Like, what's the problem here? The problem, I, I didn't know what the problem is. I, I, I would expect that scientists would be racing towards this field. And in 2012, I published a, a thought piece in Huffington Post just because I had a, an afternoon free and I banged out a blog post. And I asked, is it time for another human genome project? Do we need another big kickstart for the scientific community to get on board with this synthetic biology stuff? And of course, Huffington Post was the wrong venue. I just got dead air. But I started to meet more and more groups that were working at the forefront. And it turns out people weren't working on the second synthetic bacterium because you can't really get a grant for it. What they got grants for was to make the first eukaryotic cell. All the energy around synthetic genomes went into making a synthetic yeast genome, which is about 12 million base pairs of code. Now, a yeast, as you're probably aware, has chromosomes much more like ours than to a bacterium. It's about a billion years more evolved. So there were lots of interesting questions and things you could learn about synthesizing a yeast genome. But it was so expensive and such hard work, they had to farm it out to universities around the world. And in 2005, uh, sorry, pardon me. In 2015, I went to a meeting where they were updating the global yeast synthesis community on their progress. They'd all come together to New York. And I had this weird ambassador position that I really enjoyed. I was actually charged with going and provoking genetic engineering in the United States by the AAAS and the Lemelson Foundation. And right after my orientation at the White House, I ended up at this yeast genome meeting and they were really excited. They were making good progress. They were already thinking about what was the next organism they were going to go and synthesize. Was it, was it would be Drosophila or C. elegans? And, and I was on a panel and I said, no, you have to take a page out of history. You have to do a big inspiring project. You have to do the human genome. The reason why there's only 100 people in the room here, even though you're doing the most sophisticated genetic engineering in the world, is because the average person does not care about yeast. The average person does not care about fruit flies. The average person will not care about C. elegans. Go and do the human genome. Well, it only took six months, but we were able to wrangle a group of scientists together, and we basically launched a bottom-up genome project, the Genome Project Right. Now, the reason why it had to be bottom-up was because top-down, there was absolutely no one calling for it. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy did not want to touch synthetic human genomes. We're not talking synthetic babies here, by the way. We're just talking being able to write and assemble large chromosomes. I wasn't even that interested in doing the human genome. The only thing that mattered to me was that we put human in front of it because then humans would care. Because if we said we were going to do the mouse genome, no one would care. Anyway, this article achieved exactly what it was supposed to do. It got global news. We had got 200 million page views and 100 different news outlets in a week, which was by far the most that any of these scientists had ever been able to get their ideas into the public consciousness. Now, you, most of you probably haven't heard of it because after that initial flurry of news, it just dies down to zero and everyone gets to work. And that's what's happened over the last few years. Since 2016, we've pulled together over a thousand people, a hundred different institutions, and we've created the working groups underneath GP Wright. It's kind of boring right now. You just got to go do the hard work of looking at ethics, looking at standards, looking at technology development for new DNA synthesis tools, new, de new design languages, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really exciting. This is George Church, one of the founders of this program, said, you know, when the first Human Genome Project launched, 
It took six years just to get it to the launch. In, in less than three years, we've been able to create a global community and really put some traction underneath it. It's probably attracted about $600 million, give or take, to the various labs that are part of this community. It's not top down, it's all coming bottom up. It's important to me because right now, anyone can go and do genome synthesis in the green here. You can do it with your credit card and mail order, which is pretty remarkable. And if you're really well funded, like the Yeast Genome Project, you can go and make a yeast genome. But to get to this, to be able to go and make human scale chromosomes or plant scale chromosomes, we need a giant leap in the technology. This is science fiction right now. But once we get there, wow. And of course, once we start getting that technology, it's the tide that raises all ships. Everything comes in cheaper behind it. Two months ago, we had a publication out of Berkeley where for the first time, or I guess a few months, June, where they announced that for the first time they were starting to use enzymatic processes to assemble DNA, not phosphoramidite chemistry. That's important because that's how DNA is written. And soon, just as we've seen sequencing come to chips, synthesis is going to come to chips. In fact, I fully expect that we're going to have chip-based synthesizers that will be absolutely capable of writing human chromosome scale uh, in the next five years. So biology is technology, but I wanted to pull this tweet just to kind of set some, some parameters here. If you write the basic facts of trees but framed as technology, it sounds like impossible sci-fi nonsense. Self-replicating solar-powered machines that synthesize carbon dioxide and rainwater into oxygen and, and sturdy building materials on a planetary scale. And as I said at a meeting a couple weeks ago, I'm Canadian. We also have maple trees. It makes the finest maple syrup in the land. But like biology is an incredible technology. Like programming it is going to be absolutely incredible. Now, I'm not a top-down guy. I'm not going to go program humans. I want to go bottom up. And right now, I know that the only thing I can program with any type of precision is a virus. And that's because viruses aren't alive. Viruses don't metabolize if there's no host cell. If you design it, you can build it exactly as designed to atomic specs. The way I usually describe a virus is like a cassette tape. It doesn't play itself. You need a player. It's got a hard container. That's called the capsid. And inside, it just has a genome. And you start to pull the genome out. Well, this one doesn't want to come out. But you pull the genome out, and it's just tape. It's just magnetic tape. DNA is like magnetic tape. We just have to be able to read it and write it. Now, for those of you that have never seen a cassette tape, you can think of it <laughs> as a USB stick. It's really, viruses are USB sticks for biology. Yes, sometimes there can be a harmful program, but most of the time, they're harmless to us. They're so specific to the cells they infect. The only thing is, they don't have a standard port, so they come in all different shapes and sizes. But we've learned to harness viruses over the last 100 years, and today they save more lives than they take, at least for the ones that we know. Now, here's how you make a synthetic virus. You design the code on computer, and it's really easy because they're not very big. You turn that into a design file written in DNA, you synthesize that genome. Today, you can do it in mail order. You put it in a cell, and the cell becomes the 3D printer to make virus particles. You can literally just collect them by filtration. So I founded this company, Humane Genomics, to make cancer-fighting viruses for dogs. We made a few antibiotics first, then we started on dogs. And we made the first fully synthetic, fully designer virus that attacks a, a, a dog cancer osteosarcoma. Now we're just trying to make it faster and cheaper. We also know that we're going to have to work at the forefront of biosecurity and at personalized medicine. But if I've learned anything in this journey, it's that dogs will lead the way. <laughs> because doing a human trial is incredibly onerous and expensive, whereas doing a dog clinical trial is not. So dogs will take the risk for us. 
will learn from doing personalized treatments with dogs because there's no reason, I have no reason to make a virus for two dogs. When you build a cancer-fighting virus, it is tuned for the specific cancer, tuned for the dogs. And the pipeline is really fairly simple. I know you can't really see this, but it's essentially the, when you pull out a biopsy of the tumor and compare it to the match normal in the same dog, you get all the data you need for the design algorithm to actually design the treatment. It's, it's basically an automated pipeline. That's the fun part of this. And right now, it takes about two months to go through that whole process. I want to get it down to two weeks, and then down to two days, and eventually two hours, because the technology is going that way. Two weeks ago, just two weeks ago, the very first online viral CAD tool coupled to DNA synthesis, coupled to contract labs, appeared in the world. It's based in Venice, Italy. I called the CEO the next day and said, congratulations, because this is the future. And that future is essentially we're going to have an app store for biology. And that should scare the shit out of you. <laughs> if you've seen some of the apps on the app store. Six years ago, my colleague Mark Goodman and I wrote a piece for The Atlantic called Hacking the President's DNA, because we saw this coming. We saw this coming. We weren't worried about a global pandemic. We were worried about specific bioweapon development for high-value targets. It's, but really, every form of hacking that we have in cyber is coming to bio, to digital bio. Absolutely. So you, it's happening. In May, this article was published in the New York Times as DIY gene editing gains popularity. Someone is going to get hurt. Yes. And someone is going to get cured. But I think this was just priming the pump because the next day, Johns Hopkins ran this exercise, Cladex, a pandemic exercise where a synthetic virus starts to spread through the world. And it is scary. You know, a one-day tabletop exercise, but essentially that engineered virus killed 150 million people. And if vaccine development failed, potentially up to 900 million people, 10% of humanity. And we don't have squat for defenses right now. We don't have real-time viral detection. We don't have real-time viral synthesis. We can't make antivirus viruses. And it takes months and months and months to go and get a vaccine into production. DNA technologies are following in the footsteps of computer technologies. Everything you know about computing, come in a bio. Brilliant engineers working out of garages. Yep, got them. In fact, this guy is an ex-NASA scientist who runs a, not only does biohacking, he runs a biohacking company that sells kits, about a half million dollars worth of them a year and a conference, Biohack the Planet. And, and he's just, he's not even that special. You know, there are professors out there that have already founded companies and sold them off to pharma companies in under two years for hundreds of millions of dollars. There are literally dozens and dozens of companies in this space popping up and raising massive amounts of money. We're on track for $3 billion of investment in SIN bio companies. I've, the field is moving incredibly quickly. And it, and it should, because we've already trained over 40,000 students in the iGEM program. It's, it's grown significantly since 2003. And here's the thing. Everything in bio happens faster than in computing, because Computing is a hodgepodge of different languages and processors and architectures. Biology is all built on the same code, all on the same machinery. You learn genetics. You can program bacteria. You can program yeast. You can program whales. Which brings me to my final section, hacking humans. I don't always talk about this because it's provocative. But since you guys 
are here thinking about human biology every day, I think it's appropriate. In vitro fertilization, this is, I said the other day, this is porn for cell biologists. <laughs> this is the ICSI procedure where they take a single sperm, manually put it in the egg with a micro pipette, flush and rinse, and voila, a human life. <laughs> it's kind of awesome. We've been hacking humans for 40 years. July 25th was the 40-year anniversary of the first in vitro fertilization birth. Oh, we've got it out of sync here, but these are my hacked babies. This is my, if it shows up properly. Oh, no, let's try it one more time. Go back. That's my daughter. She was my first IVF baby. I don't know which embryo she was. We, they put in two, one came out, she wasn't genetically tested. There she's in the frunk of a Model 3. She fits nicely. This is my second engineered, oops, sorry, we're out of sync on this monitor. This is my second engineered baby, Darwin. First one was Rosalind. Darwin um, was made on the west coast and he was fully genetically profiled before implantation. It's pretty amazing how quickly the technology has changed and advanced. And soon I imagine I'll be able to get a complete genome profile, not just disease markers, and actually have a pretty good understanding of what he could be like based on the analysis of millions, if not billions, of similar genomes. IVG is what's coming, though, and IVG most people haven't heard about. It's in vitro gametogenesis. Anyone that's done IVF knows that the only 99% of the work is getting eggs, and it's expensive. With in vitro gametogenesis, you take a skin cell, turn it into a stem cell, and you can make as many eggs as you want. They've got it working for mice, as you can see, but it's gonna work for humans eventually. Combine that with CRISPR gene editing technologies, and now you can make millions and millions of eggs and select for any traits you want, and that gets weird. Also, as we start to get chromosome scale synthesis, you get to do things like C24 technologies, which is don't go and muck and edit the rest of the genome, just go and add a 24th chromosome to the human that comes preloaded with all the possible fixes or repairs or features you may want. Just be able to turn them on and off at will with various promoters. And last year, they cloned monkeys in China. So if you can clone monkeys, you can clone humans, which means things are gonna get a little weird in your business. <laughs> I'm, I'm already betting that a human cloning company will appear in the next five years. Whether they make a human clone now, I can't say, but let's just say there's no longer any technological reason for it, I, to prevent it. So just, to close, we're probably in the most exciting time in genomics ever in terms of reading DNA, being, having massive compute power to analyze, bringing in genomes from basically every species, if not millions and millions of humans, and now to be able to start writing large genomes. It, it's, it, it's a land of opportunity. And it's a land that comes with a landscape that comes with some real risks that we've never had to address as a species before. I don't know how we're going to get through it except to do it together. And I know that this community is going to be part of it. I'm sorry you were off my radar for 29 years, but I'm going to be around until <laughs> moving forward. I know you're going to be part of this future. I also know I don't want to piss you off. And I also know you're never going to be unemployed. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing such a fascinating story on such a rapidly evolving, get how I did that, field. That was really great. Thanks you a lot. You actually scared me because 
how many people did, did you ask, you know, what, what does DNA stand for? Like, how, how much was that edited? That was almost all of them that day. There was quite a few. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, especially the bio major, who <laughs> couldn't quite do it there. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much. And it looks like we have a few questions oh. that have come through. Okay, so sure. you have time for a few questions. Uh, it's, you're running the time. Great. Okay, well, I had one for myself that I came up with first, just in case there weren't too many questions. And it was going to be boxers or briefs. But <laughs> Cynthia just showed us, and you went with the boxer briefs. I, I don't even have to ask my questions, so. Do you want to see my thanks, sponsor? Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Haynes. All right, no, actually, we have some real questions, all right? So number one, you mentioned a lot of exciting prospects that are coming soon but I'm wondering if there might be any negative implications to these technologies, obviously. Is it possible that someone could abuse the technology? Oh yeah, yeah, all technologies can be abused. Um, you know, you can kill someone with a fork, uh, easier to do it with a knife, but, um, but you know, my, my speaking point on this is, is any technology can and will be abused, uh, and so it, it has nothing to do with the technology, it just has to do with human intention. Um, but there is a pretty big market. Most of us don't abuse. Most of us will use technology for good. Um, and then there's a pretty big market and need for people that, that, can, that can go and build defense systems, that can go and play the dark side and figure out how to put barriers up or do remediation. Yeah. OK, very good, very good answer. Um, another one here is uh, a dream. What are the implications of all this in 50 to 100 years? Ooh. Um, so I don't pull any punches here. I think this is actually the technology that, that changes us as a species. Uh, I don't believe in the old eugenics ideas. Those were very top-down ideas. You know, the idea that there would be a master race is crazy. What I've learned is if you give people a multiple choice, you know, A, B, C, they'll mark D, E, and F. So the more you give people access to these technologies, the more diversity you'll see um, in humanity. And, and I think that's, that's going to be a little weird for people. Yeah. Because right now, we're different skin tones, slightly different body shapes. Um, it's all just surface. But with this, we can actually start to make decisions about ourselves or about our children that will significantly branch so, you know, some of the, the trees of humanity. So kind of a Cambrian explosion, uh, I don't know. And, and of course, we're gonna get a lot of practice building a whole bunch of other creatures, microbial on up. So expect weird pet stores. <laughs> Jurassic Park, pet tyr Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, and that's the only, only, only two questions I got through the app, but I think we have time, Carol, do we have, is there anyone out here in the crowd that might have a question for Andrew? I believe we have a microphone right there. We can bring it to you. And don't worry, I know this is kind of weird stuff, but the type of stuff I want is I want decaffeinated coffee that comes straight from the tree, and I want hypercaffeinated coffee. I also, having been a, a new dad, I want the milk tribble. I, I write this all the time. I want a little tribble like Star Trek with a nipple, disembodied breasts, it purrs and coos, and you throw a few of them in the crib take them to work, whatever, because trust me, formula is so 1950s and it tastes horrible. <laughs> yes. Uh, what role, if any, does the government have in this type of development? That's a great question. Um, I don't think funding is as important as it once was, but uh, government still controls the levers of regulation. And so if I can say anything, one, they have to, they, they have to open a channel to do this, this type of engineering in a legal way at speed because, trust me, this is not limited to the US. This is a global enterprise already. It's a global challenge to who can bioengineer faster. Um, and right now, there are some significant headwinds in the United States versus Asia and probably Africa and every other place that hasn't got a rule on the books. Here comes the microphone. Um, it just, you know, listening, it's really fascinating, but I can't help thinking that when you're synthesizing new viruses, synthesizing new bacteria, that you may 
unwittingly creates something that mutates rapidly, that infects humans, that, that actually creates the next big pandemic. pandemic. Yeah, so that would be bio-error rather yeah. than bio-terror. Um, and <laughs> no, I, I think it's a significant point. Um, we're the good guys. We actually try and prevent bio-error. Um, and, and let's face it, nature has been trying to kill us from the beginning. If you imagine just the number of virus particles in all the ecosystems churning every single day, uh, I'm amazed that we're alive. Uh, so Mother Nature is, is not very kind. Um, so so I, think the, I think the possibility here to do positive things with this technology versus the negative that we already have today, the Zikas, the Ebolas, the Influenzas, whatever else happens to be spreading right now, let alone any other infection, um, I think is, uh, you know, it's a trade-off. Um, but that being said, I think even more than nuclear technologies, we have to figure out a way to uh, look for bad actors that may be using these design systems earlier, put in all sorts of precautions in the design software, in the synthesis software, and we need real-time biodetectors for things that are dangerous. Because every room that we're in has smoke detectors and various other sensors, but no biosensors. So right now, the big problem is we are the biosensor. If we get sick, we show up in a hospital after whatever time it took to incubate and we've been spreading it, and you know, if we're bleeding out an orifice, we, you know, then they have to go and reverse engineer and figure out what's going on. By then, it could be too late. It's already spreading. So I think we need to just get real, real time about life science to move forward. And then the risk drops significantly and the benefit keeps increasing. Let's get coffee. Yeah, just a suggestion. Oh, Andrew. Let's uh, give Andrew another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And while I got you up here for one more quick second, oh. I would just like to get a quick Snapchat because that's my favorite <laughs> app. This is going to look good. If you could all yeah. just kind of squeeze or lean your yeah, heads yeah, in a little. Lean, yeah. yeah, that's fine. Here we go, Andrew. We're going to go sideways here. Ready? Got it. If I can see you, a little bit of me, all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. And now it is break time. So you can go downstairs and meet with some of the vendors, but be back here by 1030. All right. Thank you very much.